Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to Young Citizens of the World, the largest global youth icon network where kids do the interviews. I'm Catherine Warren, your host and incoming board chair, speaking to you today from the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm grateful for what we can learn when we convene with purpose. We are so pleased to have Dr. Temple Grandin with us today. Welcome, Dr. Grandin. Great to be here. So happy to have you. Yep. Dr. Grandin is an animal behaviorist, an autism advocate, an inventor, and a professor. She's been named one of Time Magazine's most influential people of the year and is an inspiration for an Emmy-winning movie about her life. Dr. Grandin is quoted as saying, the most important thing people did for me was to expose me to new things. Today, young citizens of the world are very lucky to learn from Dr. Grandin as she exposes us all to new things. Please welcome Dr. Grandin. Hi, great to be here today. Our first question is from Denise, Anna and Mia at Blessed Sacrament School, Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm Denise. I'm Anna. I'm Mia. Understanding the mind, you said think in pictures. Can you tell us what that's like? How does it help you understand animals and people? I'm what's called an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture. Um, and then things that interest me, I'm it's sort of like having little uh, cell phone camera pictures as my memory. Things that interest me, I take pictures of them. Now, that helped me in my work with animals, because in the very first work I did with cattle, I got into the shoots to see what cattle were seeing. And they were afraid of things like shadows, puddles, uh, pieces of rope hanging down, maybe a vehicle parked next to the fence, kind of visual distractions, a reflection off of metal a little piece of metal that jiggled, little things we tend to not notice. Now, at the time that I was doing this, my early 20s, I did not know that other people thought in words. And that's why they thought it was odd to get in the shoots. So being a visual thinker helped me with animals because animals live in a sensory-based world. I mean, think about your dog. He's smelling something. That's like going down to the local coffee shop and getting all the gossip. What is the animal feeling? For example, the octopus lives in a touch-based world. And there's research now that shows that the object visualizer and the more mathematical pattern thinker are actually very different kinds of thinking. And I discussed that in my book, Visual Thinking. Thank you so much. A great reminder that uh, people think differently and experience the world differently, as do other animals. Well, now I also do a lot of talks with business people, and I explain that that you have different kinds of thinking. Let's just take building something like a food processing plant. The mechanical people, the visual people, build all the mechanical equipment and your mathematically trained engineers, they do the refrigeration for the plant because that requires a lot more math. You know, this is just an example of how different kinds of thinkers can work together in a complementary manner. It is, and a great reminder that it takes all kinds to build communities and businesses and Take our world to new heights. So thank you for that. Uh, next, we have students, Talia and Riley from Westmore High School in Oklahoma City. Hello, my name is Riley. And I'm Talia. We are from Westmore High School in Oklahoma. You invented the hug machine. Tell us about it. What made you want to build it? And how does it help people and other animals? Okay, when I was uh, went out to my um, aunt's ranch, um, I watched cattle going in a cattle squeeze chute. And that's a device to hold the cattle for vaccinations and it puts pressure on the side of the cattle. And I noticed that some of the cattle kind of relaxed. I had horrible problems with tremendous anxiety. So I went and tried out the cattle chute. And then I built a cattle chute-like device for myself. And there's a lot of research now that shows that deep pressure over large areas of the body can be calming. And that's the principle behind weighted blankets, weighted vests, and occupational therapy, um, therapists will use on, on, on people with autism, but deep pressure can be really calming. Another thing that can really help calming is a lot of exercise. 
doing a lot of exercise also is calming. I bet. And um, you've applied something uh, to both people and animals in that situation. And um, thank you for that. Uh, now we have two questions from Sullivan IB Middle School in South Carolina. The first from teacher Cynthia Tixiera and student Joaquin. Hi, Dr. Grandin. My name is Cynthia Texera, and I'm a French immersion teacher here in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Our questions will be to you in French and in English. This is Joaquin, and he'll be asking you your question in English. Vous travaillez avec les sciences, le design et l'ingénierie. Pourquoi pensez-vous que la créativité est importante en sciences? You work with science, design, and engineering, but also imagination. Why do you think creativity is important in science? It's important because you can see things. I've worked with a lot of people that are very talented in inventing mechanical equipment, and they just see how to build it. Uh, it's a different kind of thinking process than more mathematical thinking, where you calculate. Mathematicians see patterns. I tend to see pictures. And a lot of people that are very good at fixing mechanical things, also inventing mechanical things, tend to be visual thinkers who are not very good at, at abstract math. And both of these kinds of minds need to work together because we need both kinds of minds to get things done. We have all kinds of innovators and creators in every domain. Very important. Uh, next, we have head of special education, Dr. Savannah Keys and student Matthew. Hi, my question is, when you were in school, what kinds of challenges did you face? And what can schools do today to help kids who face similar challenges? Well, let's just separate um, uh, elementary school from high school. Elementary school went quite well for me. I went to a small elementary school and Mrs. Deach, the head teacher, explained to the other children that I had a disability that wasn't visible like a wheelchair. And instead of bullying me, they should be helping me. That's actually called peer-mediated intervention. And so elementary school went well. High school was horrible. I went to a great big high school. It was terrible. I got bullied. I got caused, caused all kind, called all kinds of names. And, and I ended up in a small boarding school for autistic kids and kids with problems. And they put me to work cleaning horse stalls and managing the horse barn. I learned how to work. That was really important. And Mr. Patey, the headmaster said, well, I'll make up the academics later. And I did. Academics are important, but it's also really important to learn working skills. And they did make up the academics later. And I'm seeing smart autistic kids today doing very well in academics, but not learning a single work skill. And that causes very serious problems when they get out of school. Um, I have grandparents that come up to me all the time, and they had paper routes when they were 11. Learned how to work. Now, I know paper routes are gone, but let's do some substitutes. Church volunteer jobs, walking somebody else's dog, the neighbor's dog, because kids need to learn how to work for a boss that's not family, and that needs to start young. I'm so sorry about that high school experience. It sounds very painful, and... Um... It was terrible. The high school was the worst part of my life. And I do have a paper you might want to read. It's a free access paper, and it's how horses helped a in uh, uh, how how horses helped an individual with autism make friends and learn how to work. And you might find that paper interesting. You can find it online, and it actually discusses peer mediated intervention, where the teacher explains to the other students that. Uh, they need to be helping me, not torturing me. A life lesson for us all. I will be reading that paper, and I'm sure many of us across Young Citizens of the World will look it up as well. Thank you, Dr. Grandin. Now, back in Canada, we have students Isaac of Ecole River Heights, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Hi, my name is Isaac. You have said the world needs all kinds of minds. How does this apply to animals and machines such as AI? I talk to a lot of um, business leaders, and I said the first thing we have to understand is that people do think differently. And the previous person asked, I talked about the building of the food processing plant, that the visual thinkers are good with mechanical equipment, and the mathematical thinkers do the more complicated refrigeration stuff that requires um, mathematicians. 
Uh, we need different kinds of minds. They're good at different kinds of things. And and when it comes to AI, um, it's only as good as, as the training database. I'm very concerned right now when there's a big lawsuits going on on copyright issues where they say, well, they don't want the AI uh, searches to go into the books or the journal articles. Well, we, we, we should not be... Um, preventing AI from going into the good stuff, which would be books and journal articles, because then it's just going to read all the other stuff online. And some of that's good and some of it's not very good. Um, but AI has to have good training data in order to operate well. So important and rights holders must be compensated for that training data and intellectual property. Um, now, uh, we are going to go back to Vancouver, BC, where Francesca, Elaine, and Mia, again at Blessed Sacrament School in Vancouver, have a question for you, Dr. Grandin. I'm Francesca. I'm Elaine. And I'm Maya. There's a lot of misinformation about autism. And its causes as well. What advice do you have on this? Thank you. Well, autism is mainly genetic mainly genetic. There are a lot of famous people who are autistic. Einstein, it's now official that Bill Gates is on the autism spectrum. You're going all the way from Bill Gates and Einstein to somebody with a lot more severe challenges, the true continuous trait, and it's mostly uh, genetic. And to address um, uh, issues of autism, you've given us some very good recommendations, including uh, starting to work at a young age and to work with outside the family, with the neighbors, and in your own community. And um, now to bring us home, we have a final question from grade two student, Marin of St. Mary's School in British Columbia. Hi, I'm Marin, and I'm from St. Mary's School with my teacher name is Reed. How can kids make a difference in our community? How can this help our world? Well, let's think of some specific things that we can do. I talked to one mom, and her autistic 10-year-old or 12-year-old became the entertainment director at the local nursing home, and he'd run the bingo nights. That's something specific. There's a lot more things we can find in the neighborhood where you could be helpful. You could help pick up trash that you know, people have thrown around. That's another thing you could do. Um, help out at a food kitchen. There's lots, many more opportunities in the neighborhood than what you would think. I talked to a veterinary tech student just the other day and when she was in high school, they were in a very low-income school. She started an FFA, Future Farmers of America Club. Well, the only resource they had in town was a local cat rescue. So they teamed up with them. Okay, that and it worked out very well, getting the students involved with uh, you know, helping cats. But that's something that was available in the neighborhood. There's a lot more things available in the neighborhood. Maybe a retired mechanic that could teach auto shop. Because that's been very effective for weaning autistic uh, adults off of video games and they discover motors are more complicated and they'll get jobs after that. Uh, we need to work on getting um, retired teachers to work with little autistic three-year-olds that are not talking because in too many places they're being put on two-year wait lists, which is bad. We've got to figure out ways to tap into a lot more resources we have that are in the community. Thank you so much, Dr. Grandin, for inspiring us today. You've reminded us to focus on doing local work, and you reminded all young citizens of the world that looking out for people and other animals helps to create stronger and kinder communities. But let's just look, look at more specific things. You see, one thing about a visual thinker, it, my thinking is not an abstract. It's not abstract, it's specific. Okay, the two specific examples were the FFA joining up with the cat rescue and the boy who became the entertainment director at the local nursing home. These were things that were just set up in the community with the resources that were there. You know, and there's a lot of retired teachers that would be willing to work with some of these three-year-olds that are getting stuck on two-year wait lists. I think we're going to have to do a lot more of those kinds of local things. And, and you see, when I think about it, it's not abstract. Mm -hmm. And visual it's also... Thinking, visual thinking is not abstract. There's a lot of verbal thinking. It's very abstract on... Um, I, heard, I read something really stupid the other day. Uh, in, I read Aviation Week for my fun magazine, and some executive was talking about infrastructure as airline. And he was talking about the layout of airplane seats in the cabin. 
I don't think that's infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree know, with you. Know, you. Really, <laughs> um, infrastructure, I'm thinking things like power plants. Okay, buying planes. That would be infrastructure, but not not cabin seat layouts. <laughs> yeah. Boy, really. Yeah. So practical, specific. Practical. These practical are the things. lessons from Dr. Grandin well, that are so just, important. Just practical things. And and I, that kind of, you know, not, yeah, uh, there's some good things that they've done in airplane layouts, and I see it. There's one where they're now a restroom in between first class and coach. I really like that. And then you don't have to walk all the way to the back. Okay, that's a nice uh, change they made in a layout. But it's a lot of other stuff. Okay, they got mood lighting on the ceiling. Is that infrastructure? No. <laughs> no. No, no, it is not. If it, buy, now you buy five new airplanes. Yeah, that's infrastructure. Infrastructure is like big stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So specific, practical, that's local, right. intergenerational. I heard you say and intergenerational. intergenerational. Because I'm 78 years old and I'm still working. I'm still teaching my class. I'm going out and doing lots of speaking engagements. And a lot of the people that are retired, they're 20 years younger than I am. Yeah. And we've got to work on a lot more local things because funding has been drying up on a 50 year cycle. I can, when I started out in research in the seventies, oh, money flowed like water. And then 20 years ago, we said, my family started shutting labs down. That started 20 years ago. Seniors are half the U.S. national budget. Yeah. yeah, we need to tap into that resource. Yeah, and we need to maintain the science and the science database. Yeah, we, need to, we need to be doing that. And, and uh, no, we need science. Yeah. Any final words, Dr. Grandin, for our youth audience around the world? Well, let's just try to find, you know, good local things you can work on. And if there's some kid that's different, maybe autistic, uh, stop the police from bullying them. Please stop that. Because high school was the worst part of my life, being constantly bullied and called all kinds of names. And the only place I had friends was shared interests, which in high school for me was riding horses and preparing for shows, for the junior shows. And um my science teacher had a model rocket club. So friends through shared interests, going back to the veterinary tech students, um, well, there were people that must have really, some people really liked cats. That'd be an example of friends who shared interest. And this one creative student, just uh, you wouldn't think Future Farmers of America would be teaming up with the cat rescue, but that's thinking about something very creatively and using resources there in the community to, to cooperate with and get the kids out doing real things. We gotta get off the devices and get out and do a lot more real things. In fact, I've got two books, The Outdoor Scientist, and the other one, Calling All Minds, it's all about inventors. I have my parachute and kite experiments in here and get kids out with other, other uh, students doing real activities. That's what we need to be doing. So well said. And if there's one thing I know about our young citizens of the world is they will listen to you. They will read these books and articles and discuss them with their very dedicated teachers. So thank you so much, Dr. Grandin. It's well, been a I wanna, privilege. I want to I wanna really encourage these young people because they're going to be leaders of tomorrow. And we need to figure out practical ways to solve problems. And I think we're going to be doing a lot more local stuff in the future. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess I'm gonna sign off now. And thank you very much for having me.